Welcome back to Texas Government. We're talking about interest groups today, which is Lesson 3 in Unit 1. So what is an interest group? We'll hear a lot, um, especially during an election cycle, about um, you know, certain candidates only um, listening to certain interest groups or being um, involved with certain lobbyists as kind of a bad thing. Um, so it, it has a negative connotation, but it actually isn't something that's negative. Um, an interest group is just an organization with the goal to influence public policy. So um, they, they're also called pressure groups, which seems like a negative connotation, but really the only goal is to um, represent a group of people who have a common interest and um, try to get policy made, laws made, um, people appointed who are going to be favorable to that group of people. An interest group has a specialized goal and specialized members with a common objective. So an interest group doesn't um, work to you know make the world a better place or stop crime or something like that that's really too broad um, so an interest group will be more specialized and we'll see as we kind of talk through it during this lecture um, that there are groups that have a, a pretty narrow scope um, in you know trying to accomplish a very specific goal the goals may be religious, it may be based on ethnicity, it may advocate for more spending and less taxation, or foreign businesses seeking to do business in Texas. Um, there can be just a million different reasons why um, an interest group can be formed or different things that, that the group is trying to accomplish. And so, um, you just kind of have to, to dig deep and see exactly what um, the group is, you know, what the real goal, goal of the group is and what the group is trying to accomplish. So there are three broad groups of um, interest groups. There are economic interest groups that seek financial advantages for their members. So you can think about it as something that's motivated by money. Um, they want more money for teachers or um, labor unions want more um, compensation for their members, things like that. There can be um, non-economic interest groups, which is doing something to seek the betterment of society or reform political, social, economic systems that are not directly um, economic. So think about civil liberties, thinking about um, defunding the police, Black Lives Matter, environmental concerns, things like that. They're motivated by personal values and a belief that they are working on behalf of the public as, you know, in general, in general, um, and that is the the group that they're trying to serve is just, you know, if we, um, for example, if we defund the police, it's going to make everybody's lives better. It's going to make um, everyone safer, things like that. So that's um, an example of a non-economic group. And then there is um, a mixed kind of interest group, which has a social goal, but they um, have some clear economic implications like fighting discrimination in the workplace. So you want to fight discrimination, um, but when you start talking about how you're doing that, it is um, an absolute economic goal. You want to um, maintain um, equal salaries for equally qualified people. So what kind of a tactic is used depends on the target of the interest group, who um, the interest group is trying to um, persuade to act on their behalf. If the target is the legislature, the interest group will probably um, engage in lobbying, which just means um, 
having people who will um, be in contact with different people in the legislature um, to educate them on certain bills or um, on different legislation that may be um, proposed that would benefit um, the group. They will provide information to um, legislators and what that means is they will you know give them all the research they need they'll say please support my bill and here you go is all the you know, here are all the statistics that um, you can cite when you are arguing this on the you know on the house floor or um, here's you know the reason why or here's the impact it would have to your um, constituents and then they will also give campaign contributions to the legislators. And, um, you know, they'll say this is on behalf of, you know, the, the Texas Realtors Association. And so then the um, legislator knows, oh, okay, that's a group that supported me. I better make sure that I know what they need um, in return. If the goal is the executive branch, so somebody may be in the governor's office, um, there will be lobbying, just like with the legislature. They will um, try to get the um, executive to make certain appointments that are favorable to the group. So a lot of times um, the governor will have the opportunity to appoint people to um, different committees, but also to um, different, you know, um, unfinished terms of um, different offices or to courts, things like that. And so they will try to get the executive to make appointments that are favorable to the group. They will co-opt agencies. We'll talk about this in um, a little more depth in the lecture about the executive branch, but the executive branch has um, a lot of different agencies and um, sometimes the lobbyists and the interest group will almost take over those agencies by um, just having so many members as part of those agencies and, and providing so much funding that it's really more of, a, of an interest group um, vehicle than actually an executive branch agency. And then again, campaign contributions. Um, like we talked about in the last couple of lectures, Texas has so many people that we elect. And so we have this huge long ballot. And so all of those people are campaigning and all of those people need campaign contributions. Um, if the um, target is the judicial branch or the judiciary, the um, interest group will try to have a say in um, judicial selection. So who is running for office for certain, um, for certain courts, and they'll make campaign contributions to those people who are running. And finally, if the um, interest group is really just targeting politics or government in general, um, the interest group will engage in electioneering, which is just out, um, you know, campaigning and actually providing um, people who will man phone banks or knock on doors or distribute literature or something like that. Um, they will make campaign contributions to campaigns that the interest group feels are aligned with what they believe. Um, they will engage in their own campaigns to educate the public and they will organize demonstrations. So um, if you want to think about different, you know, um, demonstrations that we've had in the past few years, um, like the Women's March, there will be a group or a few groups that will get together and um, say, you know, women still need more rights in order to have um, equal rights to men. And so let's um, do some social media ads and let's um, donate to the campaigns of certain women. Um, let's lead demonstrations and marches and things like that. 
And so um, they will um, use those activities in order to try to influence um, just kind of the political environment in general. So what does it take to be an interest group in Texas? Can you just um, decide you're going to be an interest group and then um, there you go? Um, no, not really. You have to register with the Texas Ethics Commission because you want everything to be above board. And, um, you know, if you're you don't want to get in trouble for making um, inappropriate or illegal um, contributions. You can engage in direct contact with officials or candidates, um, and you don't have to, you know, go through a middleman. You are the middleman, and um, if you're going to do this, you have to make sure that um, you know how the process works and you speak their language. So a lot of times, interest groups will um, employ former elected officials or former chiefs of staff, um, somebody related to an elected official. So, you know, the husband of a judge or, um, you know, the wife of a state senator. Um, there will maybe former heads of different groups like transit authorities in different cities um, so that they know how to how to speak directly to the people that they are um, trying to influence and trying to lobby. Um, if somebody just off the street comes in and tries to talk to um, talk to a legislature about, you know, here's what we need to make our group successful, they won't know exactly how to ask for specifically what they need the legislator to do. We need you to introduce a bill or we need you to support a bill or we need you to round up a certain number of votes, things like that. So um, since you are engaging in direct contact um, as a lobbyist or as a person um, in an interest group, you have to know exactly how to ask for what you want. So how does this work in um, a practical sense? The interest group will um, do a lot of research. They will memorize the elected officials and their staff and their constituents. They'll know exactly, you know, who works in their office, but also what the makeup of their district is like, you know, what kind of people um, live in their district, what kind of business is in their district, what is going to be important to this um, to this elected official. They will learn um, who's on what side of an issue. So, you know, more than just being a Democrat or a Republican, as we've talked about in Texas, that doesn't necessarily tell you everything you need to know about an elected official. Are they conservative? Are they liberal? Do they um, favor these sor sorts of regulations? Are they going to always oppose regulations that would hurt some sort of business in their um, in their you know, constituency. They will establish rapport with the officials and their staff. So the staff um, is very important because um, they are the ones who control the schedules, they um, control the access to the officials. And so they will um, establish a rapport and sometimes that means um, just being nice to them, it sometimes means, you know, finding out um, if they really enjoy um, a certain sporting event, you know, the, hey, they love Texas Longhorn football. Well, hey, we've got seats in our um, private box. We would like for you to come and be our guest and, you know, just give them certain um, kind of opportunities or, or somehow build a, a good relationship with the staff. And they will know all sides of the issues. So if there's an issue, again, it's very specialized. So if it's an issue that has something to do with um, the interest group, then they'll know the other side too. They'll know what the arguments are against the bill that they're asking somebody to vote for so that they can anticipate those and um, show why they're invalid. 
Um, interest groups spend a lot of time socializing. So like I said, there's lots of happy hours, there's lots of football games or baseball games, and um, you know, they're not sitting out in the bleachers, they're, you know, nice catered events and, and luxury suites. Um, there's, you know, no spared expense. They will spend a lot of time um, hosting benefits or, um, you know, engaging in like plays and theaters, sponsoring plays and theaters to have people um, come and enjoy that event, but also get to have a, you know, a happy hour or meet and greet um, before or after. They appeal to the emotions and ideologies of the elected officials. So they'll remind the elected official um, you know, what is important and why to the group. And, um, you know, they'll remind the elected official, hey, we're all Republicans here, or, hey, we're all um, liberals on this side of, of the um, issue. And here's why, you know, this is why you need to vote for the issue. Um, they will, you know, use basically pull out all the stops, remind, um, the official, you know, hey, remember you have kids that go to school in um, this district and would be affected by these different educational laws that we're proposing. They'll remind the official of past support. So remember when we gave you $500,000 for your last campaign or um, remember when you needed um, extra staff members so that you know your staff could all leave and go on you know a certain event together and we provided you with temps to take over things like that just any kind of support that they've given in the past and they'll know who to target so they're not going to just spend their time targeting the um low level you know first year senator, state senator, um, who doesn't really have any influence um, and maybe is not on the right side of the issue historically or doesn't have any um, kind of a stake in the issue um, because of what their constituency looks like. They're going to find out who they need to target and target those people specifically. They um, are going to target the executive's implementation agencies. So we will talk about um, agencies when we talk about the executive branch, but agencies have um, broad discretion on how to enforce state laws that are enacted by the legislature. Um, and so they will um, make sure that they are influencing these implementation agencies um, to enforce the laws correctly or enforce the laws that benefit their um, interest group. They um, consider themselves as providing a public service to um, help these laws get um, implemented fairly. They will help um, the agency draft different rules or regulations to um, help them determine how different laws should be applied in different situations. And they read the Texas Register daily to know um, when to comment and when to testify, when to um, ask, you know, different um, legislatures to make comments or to um, ask certain questions of people testifying. The Texas Register is just um, a report of everything that goes on um, in Texas government. And so it'll let you know kind of what bills are up for debate on certain days or what committees are going to be um, seeking testimony about um, certain bills or certain issues, things like that. They will target the appointment process. There are lots of different um, places where the governor of Texas um, can appoint different people to either finish out terms or to be heads of committees. Um, and they will, 
target the governor to make sure that if it's an agency that has anything to do with the interest group, that um, there are people who um, support the interest group's goals who are going to be um, a member or the head of certain agencies. So a lot of times retired um, agency officials will become lobbyists because then they can speak directly to the governor and say, hey, I was, you know, on this agency for um, many years. I headed this agency um, for a number of years. Let me tell you who you need um, in the agency to make sure that the right decisions are made. And they will form alliances with these agencies. So they'll say, hey, like, you need to listen to what we're saying. You need to make sure you're um, enacting these certain regulations um, correctly. And by the way, um, if you, you know, decide to retire, you could always come work for us and help influence the next generation of agency officials. And we'll give you this big old pile of money at the same time. These um, interest groups will support candidates to win nominations. So um, they will give you know, their monetary support, but they'll also call and, and kind of campaign on these different candidates to win different nominations. Um, they will contribute to campaigns um, of judges if there is business in front of that court. So um, when you go to court, realize that the judges in Texas are elected and um, other than the federal judges, but the state judges are elected all the way up to the Supreme Court of Texas or the Court of Criminal Appeals and um, realize that those people have campaigned and somebody has paid for their campaign. So it's more than just the actual case before the court. There may be a lot of um, backstory that that you make you need to make sure you know if there is um, an appointment happening so somebody is going to be appointed to finish out the term or until there's a special election um, they will influence whoever is making the appointment so that when the election comes around for the next term or um, you know a special election to finish out that term um, the person who was appointed is then the incumbent. And we'll talk about um, in another lecture how, you know, it's super easy to win an election if you're an incumbent. Much, much easier than if you are um, the person challenging somebody who's been in that office for many years. Um, if there is an issue that could be taken before one of the courts. The um, interest group may challenge, you know, may take a case and fund a defense so that the law can be challenged in court and um, rulings can be made. So I know this wasn't um, this wasn't a Texas case. It was a federal case involving um, a Texas plaintiff, but the Roe versus Wade abortion case. Um, that was funded by interest groups, the defense and the prosecution of that case. Um, that was not just, you know, some um, hometown lawyer who took the case. It was somebody who was being bankrolled by different um, interest groups. And it was, you know, on both sides. They will mobilize members to vote on certain issues by encouraging them to vote, you know, telling them why they should vote, how it will benefit them and their constituents directly, and also educating the um, people who may be just kind of on the fence about the issue or maybe don't see how it really affects anybody in their district. Um, they'll, they'll catch those um, kind of peripheral votes and, um, get people to show up and cast their vote um, on certain issues or certain legislation that is going to um, benefit the interest group. The interest groups will contribute to campaigns like we've talked about um, and if they contribute enough they'll be able to have more access to 
um, the people who are eventually elected. So, um, you know, people who give a lot of money to a campaign um, not only, you know, get the benefit of their person winning, potentially, but they know that after that person wins, then they will be able to um, have access to that, you know, powerful elected official. And then they can, you know, meet with those elected officials once they're elected and um, try to make sure that they will vote a certain way on certain issues and remind them, of course, of the amount of money that was contributed to their campaign. Um, and like we talked about before, interest groups will work to educate the public so the public can put pressure on their elected officials and they will organize public demonstrations which will um, influence the elected officials. You know, if they see that everybody in their district is out marching um, in support of a certain issue, then, you know, they'll realize this is how many voters showed up to march for or against a certain issue, and maybe I should make sure I am voting the correct way. So how much money are we talking about when we talk about um, contributions by different interest groups to um, people who are going to be, you know, making those decisions in the government. Um, I've just listed out on this slide um, different, um, you know, different interest groups and how much money that they have um, given in different elections or different years, um, and we're talking a lot of money. Um, the Texas Association of Realtors gives a ton of money to make sure that um, elected officials are um, enacting legislation that will benefit the realtors, will allow the realtors to stay in business and um, to you know, continue conducting their jobs um, in the same, you know, in the same manner. Um, the Texans for Lawsuit Reform are people who think that um, tort reform, it's businesses who think that tort reform is necessary, basically saying, um, you know, people can sue for too much money and we should limit the amount of money that somebody can get when they file a lawsuit um, because these businesses who keep getting sued or the doctors who keep getting sued are um, you know having to to pay too much money um, in order to um, satisfy these different judgments and so you can just see just going down the line there's lots of groups that will um, donate a million dollars a year in order to make sure that um, that there are elected officials that are voting in favor of issues that benefit those groups. And here on this slide, I've just kind of highlighted the different kinds of groups that are getting the benefit. So um, the real estate group, tort reform, is these are the goals of the different groups, tort reform, um, which would be businesses, um, the transportation sector, the transportation industry, insurance companies, um, labor unions, things like that. So I put in the um, assignments that one of the discussion boards is to tell us about um, an interest group, or sometimes they're called PACs, P-A-C, Political Action Committees. So um, find one, you can just Google around and you'll be able to find um, the name of, of one that operates in Texas. Um, you can look on the Texas Ethics Commission um, website and they will give you all kinds of reporting for different groups. So I want you to kind of look into groups, a group, and when you're looking into a group, you can find a lot of um, information to kind of give you a hint at what the group's real goals are. You can see how much money they spent um, in the last election cycle and how much they raised. Um, what's their goal? What's, you know, what kind of a candidate is going to benefit from this lobby? Um, 
what, uh, how long has it been operating, who founded it, kind of what does it do? Um, and that'll tell you more than just kind of their generic name. Um, you know, Texas for Lawsuit Reform doesn't really tell you much. You have to kind of dig down and see who is donating to it. How much money are we talking here? Is this a really powerful lobby? Um, now, in the discussion board, you don't need to put all of this information. This is just some um, information that you can be um, kind of armed with when you are looking into um, different lobbies. Okay, so we've talked about how much money that they have, um, but what else does lobbying tell us or what kind of power do these lobbyists have? Well, if we look at the amount of money and where the money is being spent by certain lobbies, it'll give us a hint of what kind of legislation is on the way. So if we see a lot of money being spent by lobbyists for um, the legalization of marijuana, it can give you a hint about what kind of legislation may be um, on its way for decision in the House or the Senate, the Texas House or Texas Senate. Sometimes lobbies work independently and sometimes they will work together to um, accomplish a, a goal that is common to a number of different lobbies or different, when I say lobbies, I mean political action committees, I mean interest groups, just, you know, the group that is um, trying to influence um, the government. And sometimes they are permanent um, groups that will be around forever, and sometimes they're just around for a certain election cycle, um, you know, tr for a, a specific goal. There are some, um, if you go to Austin and you take a walk around the Capitol, um, you'll see just, you know, a block from the Capitol, there are lots of different businesses or lobbies that have big um, permanent structure offices in different buildings um, very close to the Capitol, like the Texas Association of Business or Texans for Lawsuit Reform. Texas Association of Realtors. These are these are interest groups that are around permanently, and they have set up um, their offices very near to where the um, capital is. So, like I said, um, lobbying and um, PACs often get um, you know have a negative connotation, but there is a positive influence. They give the public more direct access to public officials. So if you're a big donor to a um, political action committee, you will get more direct access to public officials. There's um, more access to public officials in, um, you know, just the off years when there's not an election because these lobbyists are um, operating, you know, all the time to um, be in contact with these different elected officials. They provide education. They, you know, give different statistics and they have conducted studies or polls or, um, you know, done different research based on um, the issues that they are trying to influence the official about. Um, and they'll provide all that to the official. Um, sometimes you'll say like, oh, we don't want, um, you know, the certain lobbies to take over because they will just um, basically take over the entire government and um, it'll be just a bunch of non-elected officials, private, private groups running the government. Um, there is always going to be balance. So um, every time you have a group like Vote Blue who tries to promote every um, Democratic candidate, you'll have another equally powerful group that is the, you know, Vote Red group that, or the Keep Texas Conservative kind of group. And so um, there is, you know, balance because of just kind of the, the free market. And then finally, the, the pluralist theory of government 
is that um, the more ideas that we have um, being entertained in our government and being pushed in our government, the better. So we need um, more voices to help the government be a government of all instead of just a government run by few. Now, there is a, you know, there's a negative implication for a reason that's not completely, they're not um, completely um, altruistic groups with, you know, the only the best voting um, interest at heart. Um, some believe that interest groups are only for the rich and for their interests, and this is an elitist form of government which says that the many are ruled by a small few who can participate. And this is not untrue. Um, in order to really have access to candidates and really be powerful in um, an interest group, you have to give that interest group an, like enough money, a lot of money. And we saw you know, a million bucks a year is what they're gonna spend on different elected officials, and that money has to come from somewhere. Often elected officials don't have the time or the money to conduct research on certain issues themselves. So the only information they get is from interest groups and interest groups aren't required to present, um, you know, research that doesn't benefit their group. And so they often won't. Um, legislative pay is very low. And so interest groups are able to supplement this um, by you know, providing additional staff or providing um, additional resources for the elected officials. But then once um, you, know, you have accepted all of this help from a group, you're kind of beholden to that group. Um, there is a revolving door between lobbies and government officials. So somebody can be um, a government official one day and then a lobbyist the next day and then vice versa. There's no waiting periods um, in place. And so this is a way to um, buy a vote. And, um, you know, it's a conflict of interest when a public official benefits personally from a vote. So, um, you know, if you're a, a government official one day and they, the lobby says, hey, if you'll vote a certain way, we'll give you a job next year as a lobbyist and you'll be making, you know, 50 times your current salary. Well, that seems like it's a bought vote to me. And then finally, there are things called late train contributions, which are um, fundraising parties that honor the winners of an election. So it's sometime between November and December. So after the election, if there's, let's say we have an election and um, Senator John Cornyn is up for re-election this year. And so say Senator Cornyn wins. Um, if there is a group that has, um, you know, a congratulations party, um, a celebration party for him November 15th, which is after the election, um, and it raises all this money for his office, for his campaign, for him. Um, that is something that is, um, seems pretty shady, that um, the group would be raising a lot of money that goes just to, um, the candidate who's already actually won the election. There are regulations in place, a few um, regulations in place, and really um, the Texas Ethics Commission has been called a pretty good library but a pretty bad cop because really the laws that they are enforcing are just reporting laws. So um, Interest groups have to register. They have to tell um, who their clients are, their areas of policy concern, but that's very broad. I mean, they can just say lawsuit reform, and that doesn't really tell you anything. Um, they have to tell the compensation range of different lobbyists, but again, that's very large. You know, $100,000 to $200,000 is a pretty big 
range. Um, they have to list their expenditures on advertisements, and then they have to list their expenditures on food, drink, or gifts that they spend on legislators if it's more than $114 a day. Um, so, and I can imagine there are a lot of tricks um, in place to make sure that um, the legislator benefits from the group um, less than $114 a day, but still is able to get a substantial benefit. So there's no regulation, like I said, regarding a waiting period. So somebody can be in office today, cast their vote, and retire tomorrow and have a job as a lobbyist. And this is, um, there's nothing anybody can do about it. There have been some reform attempts in 2015. Um, Governor Abbott said this was going to be his, you know, top five high priority emergency items that he was going to work on. He was going to make sure there was a waiting bill um, enacted, you know, or introduced, meaning that there had to be a waiting period between the time you stopped serving as a public official and started being a lobbyist. Um, that bill didn't have any traction. It did not progress. Um, there was an increased transparency bill um, and a reduced conflict, conflict of interest bill, meaning more reporting, more information released about the activities of interest groups. But these were vote vetoed because the bills were written um, with different other legislation kind of um, slid in and loopholes and so um, the governor was able to veto these saying that there wasn't it wasn't a good enough bill. Um, in 2017 the legislature tried to pass um, reform that limited the governor's practice of appointing campaign contributors to agencies um, or to you know just different um, offices but the governor didn't support the bill obviously, because it was limiting his, um, his power um, and also limiting his ability to raise money. And so the bill um, died in the Senate. And we'll talk about this later, but really if a bill is going to um, become a law, it's going to need the support of the governor. Even though the governor's not the one you know, casting a vote for the bill, he can cast a vote against. And um, and it's just also very hard to get a bill passed if the governor doesn't approve it. So let's talk about um, Tesla versus the Texas Auto Dealers Association. So we all know Tesla, the cars that we love um, or covet. Um, and Tesla's business model was to sell their cars direct to the public. So you could buy a car basically from a store, um, from a salesperson or over the internet. Um, you didn't need to go to a dealership um, in order to buy a Tesla. And so this violates um, a Texas law that requires that um, cars only be sold through dealerships. Um, the dealerships in Texas are um, represented by a lobby called the Texas Auto Dealers Association. So um, Elon Musk spent a million dollars in 2015, I believe. Um, he hired 24 lobbyists whose job was to convince um, elected officials to vote in favor of um, a law that allowed Tesla to sell direct to the public. Um, Elon Musk wanted to put 12 stores in Texas that would sell um, Teslas. And that's, you know, that's all he wanted. He didn't want a store in every, um, you know, shopping center. He just wanted to be able to sell out of 12 stores in Texas. Now, the Texas Auto Dealers Association represents a significant number of auto dealers. Specifically, about 
um, 1,200 auto dealers throughout Texas. And so the Texas Auto Dealers Association reminded all of the elected officials, hey, we represent um, people who um, are a significant amount of business in your, um, your district. They employ a lot of people in your district. They provide a lot of money to sports teams, to the local high school, um, you know, put up their, sponsor their scoreboard at their football field. They, they are vital members of your communities. And so um, remember that and don't vote um, in favor of a law that would allow Tesla to, to set up stores in um, Texas. And so what happened? The um, law failed because there were just so many more um, people involved, so much more money involved, so much more power with the Texas Auto Dealers Association than there was with Elon Musk and um, Tesla that Elon Musk ended up losing. So that is all about interest groups. I want you to, um, you can take the quiz, you can go to the discussion board and contribute to the discussion about um, interest groups.